Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Today's the third Wednesday of the month, which means it's time for none other than Dr. Stefan Essert. This is your prescription for health. He covers a different topic every month, and today it's the pancreas, specifically plants and the pancreas. Please welcome him back to the show. How was your holiday? I haven't seen you since last month. Hi, it's great to see you. It was wonderful. Some time with family and friends, and I hope you had a great time too. Oh, well, I did. I, I Do you happen to remember what was served and did you make it? I did. Well, it was a shared combination. My wife and I both made dishes. And so it was all the things you'd expect, the sweet potatoes and the steamed greens and the cranberry sauce that I make that's raw and the, you know, all different types of rices and, you know, a whole host of different things. It's, it's always just kind of this big cornucopia of flavors and tastes and colors. I love that, a cornucopia. You know, I don't know why people bother to ever make a cranberry relish, because like you, I make one raw, and uh, it, it's so much easier for one. And you know what's funny? Because I usually make it with just three ingredients, cranberries, dates, and oranges. And I was out of dates, and I just couldn't bear going to Costco, and I substituted persimmons, and it was amazing. Perfect. You know, I mean, bringing that sweet and that sour, bringing it together. I mean, I agree with you. The simpler, the better, and the fresher. I mean, it's just so tasty. <laughs> You work with a lot of people just in general as a doctor, but also in this space of, you know, health and wellness and weight loss. And, you know, I've interviewed probably over 2000 people now, and I haven't had one successful person said, you know, the secret to my success is I make a different recipe that's very complicated every day for breakfast, lunch and dinner. This idea of simplicity, you know, because people follow these, they're wonderful, these people on Instagram, but in the real world, the, the way you post on Instagram, the way I eat, I think that's, well, I think it's delicious, but I think it's really over time the most sustainable. I agree. And I think, you know, when you fail to live up to these Instagram worthy photos and, you know, recipes, then you can feel shame, depression, anxiety. I'm not living up to this expectation, right? There was this bar way up here and I failed it. And uh, that, of course, then leads to what? I'm going to go to McDonald's. I'm going to go to Chick-fil-A. I'm just going to pick up some haagen Who cares? It's not even doable. Chef AJ is probably lying anyway. Dr. Esther is probably eating who knows what. Yeah. And, so, and yet the reality is it's, we're successful because we simplify the program. Absolutely. Yeah. 100, I think 100%. That, that is the reason fast food is successful. They've simplified it for you. You just basically drive through and roll down your window. That's right. And it's almost even more painless. Now you just scan your card. You don't even feel the cash leaving your fingertips. So it's, uh... Wouldn't it be cool if like we, I mean, I've always dreamed about this, like, cause you know, I've been vegan almost 50 years and there weren't even vegan restaurants most of my life, let alone vegetarian. But if we had that idea, but with plants, I mean, they are having vegan fast food places now, but they're not healthy. But can you imagine like just going through a drive through and getting like a steamed, uh, like a, like a true North meal, you know, I'll have right. the true number one, you know? Right. I hope that over time we'll, we, we will see that, you know, but uh, obviously, as you and I know, addiction dies hard. That's yeah. right. And, yeah, and that's the, thing the, is, the pleasure trap is a place where most people reside. And I just feel like the way we eat, it looks, they think, it, uh, yeah, here, this is, these are the adjectives I hear, draconian. Austin. <laughs> I've heard those words before, except to describe the way I eat. But those of us that eat this way, you know, as a true North for two weeks, we love the food. We're not, we don't feel like it's punishment or deprivation. We, we just love the food there. Well, I think priorities are mismatched, aren't they? Because people are putting the food on this pedestal as though every, you know, sort of meal has to be like a sexual orgasm instead of recognizing that the food is the foundation of their whole life. And if you if you haven't mismatched, your priorities are wrong. You're just going to live from meal to meal until you have your heart attack, your stroke, your pancreatic cancer, as we're going to talk about, et cetera, instead of that food is the nourishment for my body to be able to out, be out there and thrive. So that I get those extreme highs and enthusiastic, amazing experiences from the rest of my life, not yeah. from the food, right? And so sadly, I think so many people are just stuck in the trap and don't recognize their missed priorities. But we're here, to, we're here to help them realign them. <laughs> well, I think Dr. Esther, that a lot of people are in the trap because there's so many people with them. How can they be, how can it be a trap when everybody else looks like me and eats like me? That's right. And, and so the, the, the need is right to continue as you're doing, sharing this message, more people's lives transform before we know it. Now we've got pockets and then whole areas and then, you know, continents of healthy minded people. And so little by little. 
All right. Well, thank you for doing your job. I'm very interested in this topic. My brother died fairly young. He was a medical doctor of pancreatic cancer three months from the date of diagnosis. And, you know, it was one of those things that I, I, I mean, cancer is not always a death sentence, but I think a lot of times with pancreatic cancer, for some people it is, because I know that that's the one cancer Dr. Goldhammer really doesn't accept patients for. So I'd love yeah. to know more about its cause and its cure if there is one, because it, it that people do get this type of cancer quite frequently, at least that I know of. I've known several. So Right. Well, I'm sorry for your loss with that. And, and certainly each one of the topics that we're going to talk about briefly today could do it a whole talk on. So we're not necessarily going to go into a deep dive in each area of the pancreas. My goal with these talks over the next couple of months that we're together is to actually kind of hit each major you know, organ, body system, et cetera, and teach the viewers a little bit more about that organ. How does it work? What's it all about? Um, and then what can go wrong with it? And why is there this overlapping interrelationship between what we do, uh, both with plants, with the food, as well as with our fingers and our feet, with our activity and other aspects of lifestyle? And so we're going to kind of be a little bit more superficial, but we're still going to get, uh, you know, kind of down into some of the weeds a little bit. So, uh, yeah, let's jump right in. And uh, here we go. You tell me if you can see it. Yeah. Aren't you the one that used to say fingers, feet, and forks? That's right. Yeah, I love it. The three Fs. The master levers of our health destiny, right? As they say. Yep. So here we are. I so let's jump it. right in. We're going to get talking here. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with me, love you to join me in social media if and when you want. And if I can ever be of service, uh, musculoskeletal care wise, essersports.com. Now doing some long distance consults with regards to biologics as well. Um, so let's get right in here and talk a little bit. So plants in your pancreas and my goals today are going to visit the anatomy classroom. We're going to discuss some common pancreatic conditions. We're going to review some intersections between pancreatic conditions and your personal behaviors. And just a simple lineup of kind of what are things that you should be doing, uh, for an overall healthy pancreas. So the pancreas is a pretty fascinating little organ, and I encourage each of you to kind of reach down and touch your stomach kind of in this area and feel it. It's just below the level of your ribs, what we call the subcostal margin. And so kind of feel up in there. Do you feel kind of the bottom of your ribs? And now on the left-hand side um, and slightly center just above the belly button, right in there is where your pancreas lives which is pretty interesting. Normally you can't really feel it because your abdominal muscles, the rectus abdominis and the big fascial planes in between are kind of blocking you from truly touching it unless you have a hernia. Um, and so, but it's right in that area. Wrapped up, you can see uh, on this image here, you can see the intestinal tract. This is the large intestine here, small intestines coming up, wrapping around and the stomach uh, really close to it. So usually the stomach's slightly in front, the pancreas slightly behind. Um, but it's just kind of wrapped up in the folds of this intestinal tract. And this image of the anatomy of the pancreas shows us just how closely interrelated these organs and structures are. So you'll notice this yellow fatty appearing pancreas right here, made up of these little separate globular regions, these little, uh, some of them islets, they're called islets of Langerhans. You may recall this term from your biology classes. And, uh, and then right next to them, different secretory little glands that produce mucus and bicarbonate. Now, the anatomy of the pancreas is such that it is right close to the small intestinal tract. So it can dump digestive enzymes directly into the intestinal tract. And on the other side of it, we have, of course, all the different blood vessels that intersect and come into the body of the pancreas. Uh, and then the kidneys, right? There's a kidney over here, another kidney on the other side. But this gives you a good sense of kind of how important, and I bring this up, the pancreas is because it has multiple sort of uh, aspects to it, has multiple abilities. And we call these an exocrine function and an endocrine function. The exocrine aspect is making reference to the digestive enzymes that are produced within these secretory cells of the pancreas and that are dumped into the intestinal tract. The endocrine aspect is what is put directly into the bloodstream, right? So exocrine outside of, right? Essentially it's pumping into this open space in the digestive tract. An endocrine internal inside of, it is putting it right into the bloodstream. And so the primary exocrine function of the pancreas is to produce digestive enzymes, trypsin, chymotrypsin, which help digest proteins, 
lipase and the rest for fats, and lactase and amylase for starches. Now remember that when the food that you've consumed is coming out of, right up in here would be the stomach. When it's coming out of the stomach, it is this chyme. It is this sort of very acidic fluid, right? With the chunks of food, with all of the hydrochloric acid, with the intrinsic factor that's produced in the, in the, in the stomach. All of this is dumped into the intestinal tract and it's under tight control. If you consume something that's very protein rich, something that's very concentrated, it stays in the stomach longer in order for it to be broken down, in order for it to be de de its concentration to be decreased uh, before it is dumped into the intestinal tract. If something is less concentrated, let's say a cup of water, or for example, right here, I'm drinking a little bit of hibiscus tea, um, you know, have a little hibiscus tea, it's going to get through that stomach into the intestines very quickly. So there's also a sphincter at the bottom of the stomach, which is a little valve that controls the movement of fluid out of the stomach. And that is under control of different sensors that are aware of pH and that are aware of concentration, among other things. And so when that sphincter, that little valve at the bottom of the stomach opens up, now the food, this chymous acidic sort of solution is dumped into the intestinal tract. Now you would imagine a very acidic fluid coming to the intestines could harm all of the cells that line the intestines because it's delicate. And so it's crucial that the intestines themselves produce mucus and that also the pancreas is producing bicarbonate and mucus, which helps to offset the acidity of the fluid coming out of the stomach. So it's balancing out, right? Because the, the acid in the stomach is there to release, to break down these outer layers in particular of fiber, right? That are around the nutrients and plants. That's a great example. Um, and when it breaks that down through the acid and then through the rugae of the stomach, the rugae are these rough edges on the inside of the stomach. Your stomach's actually doing this when it has food in it. And as it's moving in that way, it's grinding up and breaking up and mixing and stirring all of the solution that's in the stomach. And this is one of the reasons why I do not advocate consuming large quantities of water while you eat. It is because when you get the food into your stomach, you want it to stay there as long as the body needs to, to break it up longer. And so when you eat food with a lot of water, you decrease the concentration of the food in the stomach and the stomach opens up and lets that food out faster. And you may decrease some of your absorption. So preferably you would drink your water prior to a meal or an hour or so after a meal, but not directly with that meal. Um, because you want that food when it gets into your stomach to be concentrated so it stays in the stomach a long time. The acid breaks down, the fiber releases the micronutrients, the rugae do a mechanical breakdown as well. And then this is dumped into the intestinal tract. Now, all along, as you smell the food, as you think of the food, and as you then eat the food, your body is prompting the pancreas through different factors called secretin and cholecystokinin to begin this production of enzymes, which then can be used in the digestive process, right? So again, a reminder here, just to show you as well, this interrelationship of the gallbladder, which we'll talk about later, and the pancreas, right? So this gallbladder is dumping out bile, which comes down and joins and enters into the intestinal tract here. And depending upon how a person is made, it can branch into the pancreas, around, through, et cetera. So there is this interrelationship between the two. As I mentioned, as you saw kind of up here on this slide, it's quite impressive to think that exocrine wise, the pancreas produces one to four liters of fluid per day. That's a lot of this sort of mucus and these digestive enzymes, depending upon what your body needs, right? In order to digest adequately the foods that you're consuming. So that's a lot of fluid it's pumping out. And that's why it's crucial that you're eating water rich foods along with drinking adequate amounts of purified water. Endocrine wise, the primary role and goal of the pancreas is to maintain a stable blood sugar level. As you and I know, when you consume certain foods, your blood sugars rise and then they decline as the body either uses up those blood sugars in the bloodstream or stores them as glycogen in your muscle or in your liver. And when the body is consuming these foods, especially those that are richer in, let's say, sugar. So for example, I just had some nice sweet potatoes with some steamed broccoli a couple minutes ago. 
And those sweet potatoes, right, have some nice sugars in them, which of course is crucial. Sugar gets a bad name, and yet we need those sugars. We need those carbohydrates, both simple and complex. As you recall, so many of our organs live off of purely just sugar, especially in particular, think about our brain, which only works off of glucose. And so we want those unprocessed whole foods in their natural form. And when you're consuming them, right, that blood sugar will climb normally, and that's very natural. And your body then will produce the right amount of insulin, right, in order to help stabilize those blood sugars, store the sugars in the form of glycogen, and use it within the cells. Now, let's say you're out for a long period of exercise. Well, now you need that glucagon to increase so it can help break down some of the stored glycogen turn it into glucose, and you can use that glucose, right, for your energy source when you're jogging, running, doing Pilates, playing some pickleball, whatever it might be. So there's this balance between the exocrine function, the endocrine function, and even in that endocrine level, there's this constant balancing out of insulin and glucagon and somatostatin and these other aspects of the pancreas and what it's functioning and doing. And I point this all out to you because immediately you all have your science caps on, I hope, and you're thinking in your head, wow, the pancreas is a pretty important organ. And yes, it is. So important, right? Uh, because it's not only functioning in one, right, organ system, it's functioning in two. It's functioning in digestion, and it's functioning also in the endocrine world, which is so crucial. Remember, insulin is a growth factor, right? There's so many aspects of this that we could get into, right? And just sit in a state of physiology for a full hour, but we won't, don't worry. Um, but I think it's so fascinating and so important for you to think about this. And this is why your pancreatic health matters so much. So when we think about that pancreatic physiology, let's start with number one, right? So if there's acid that enters into the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine, as it comes out of the stomach, uh, it causes these enteroendocrine cells of the duodenum to release secretin. You heard me say this earlier, right? And so secretin prompts the pancreas then to produce, right, more of the bicarbonate secretions. It says, whoa, it's too acidic in here. I need to offset this because otherwise I'm going to burn some of my intestinal cells. And so what does it do? It releases secretin to get more bicarbonate. And when we eat, let's say, a fatty, proteinaceous, rich meal, right? Let's say we had some beans and grilled tofu and uh, maybe or maybe we had some cashews earlier, et cetera. You know, these foods are going to prompt the body to release some cholecystokinin. And this is going to cause different enzymes for digestion to be released out, out of these acinar cells um, that are in the pancreas itself. And let's not also forget, right, as I mentioned, that even thinking about food, smelling food, seeing food has this vagal stimulating effect, right? That's the central nervous system affecting via the vagus nerve, the largest parasympathetic nerve in the body, which is all about rest and digestion. So, you know, this is why it's it's just amazing when you think about this to me. I mean, every time I, you know, this is why I want you to romance your food. Now, I want you to, when you make, like I was looking at this broccoli that I was steaming and I was just looking and going, you're beautiful. Like just this light green color. Then it was getting a little darker, right? And I was watching it because I don't want that overcooked broccoli. I like it when it's just a little bit of, you know, edge to it, you know, a little bit of crispness to it, but getting that beautiful, perfect, you know, look. And then also my sweet potatoes, right? That I baked. I had these gorgeous organic sweet potatoes recently, a big case, and I've just been making them just about every day. Um, into little pieces and baking them at 405 degrees for about 45 minutes. Yeah. And uh, and they're just, when they're, boy, these organic ones that I recently got, they're such a gorgeous color. But even as I'm thinking about that, remember, right? I begin to feel a little bit more saliva in my mouth. Well, that's because the vagus stimulating this release. I begin to have a little more digestive juice release. That's what's happening. So you want to always romance your food in this way because it actually has physiologic effects downstream. Now, when we think of the pancreas, it has a lot of needs, right? But, but the primary ones are going to be blood flow, nutrition, and exercise. We're going to talk about these in some level of detail. I mean, if we go back to this slide, you notice it's so apparent, this blood vessels, right? These blood vessels are crucial to feeding uh, this pancreas. Immediately when you hear the word blood vessel, right, I think about pathology. What can happen to this blood vessel? Well, we know that if you get high blood pressure, high cholesterol, you develop atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, blockages of the arteries. You know, we love to talk about blood flow when it comes to things like the heart, but it's crucial to remember that blood flow is essential for every single organ. So if you think you're prematurely aging, well, how much that is just related to inadequate perfusion, not getting enough blood flow to the surface of your skin. Maybe we'll do a whole talk about the skin and plants, et cetera. That'd be a fun topic too. 
But, you know, here, the blood vessels there are permeating into this pancreas, tiny little arteries and little venules that leave. And if you begin to have, you know, increased amounts of atherosclerotic disease, you're going to block blood flow into these little nooks and crannies of the pancreas. And that's where we're going to talk about things like pancreatitis that begin to develop. So blood flow is absolutely crucial for the health of the pancreas. And of course, blood flow is important because it carries nutrition carries oxygen, carries away toxins and degenerative breakdown products from metabolism. And then exercise is great because it dilates blood vessels and increases blood pressure short term. So it kind of squirts that blood deeper into the pancreas as you're exercising. At the heart of our conversation today is this basic question. Does what you eat matter to your pancreatic health? Do plants improve pancreatic health and do plants reduce risk of common pancreatic conditions? Well, and other lifestyle factors as well. So it's interesting, as I was preparing for this conversation, I was going through the medical literature, right? It's going through different articles and et cetera. And it was fascinating to me to see that there is an incredible amount of literature supporting interrelationship of the personal lifestyle choices we make um, to our pancreatic health. And so it's very important that you recognize that the science strongly supports this. We're going to go just in the superficial. I'll dive in a little bit, but I'm not going to just put up study after study after study because we could do that all day. And it would save to us what we can get out in fewer words. So the pathology of the pancreas that we're going to talk about are four primary areas. We're going to talk about pancreatic insufficiency, type 1 diabetes, pancreatitis, uh, and pancreatic cancer. Um, so let's kind of get in there a little bit. So pancreatic insufficiency is a condition in which the body cannot efficiently digest and absorb fats, proteins, carbohydrates, vitamins, et cetera, uh, due to reduced exocrine function of the pancreas. Remember, two functions. Exocrine, producing all the enzymes, digestive enzymes, uh, mucus, bicarbonate, uh, endocrine function being all about controlling blood sugars. There are a lot of risk factors for developing pancreatitis, or pardon me, pancreatic insufficiency. And these, you can see some of them up there, right there, chronic pancreatitis, uh, you know, various surgeries that you may have had in the intestinal area, uh, Crohn's disease, this inflammatory autoimmune condition of the lining of the gut that can cause scarring, right? A across the little ampulla, a little opening through which the enzymes are dumped. Um, and then alcohol consumption, which appears to be a serious toxin in particular for pan the pancreas itself. Um, so it turns out that when it comes to pancreatic insufficiency, uh, a lot of different factors can play a role in its function. Hey, where did my, I have a couple other slides here. They don't seem to have saved over, um, but, but we'll, we'll jump through a couple others here. So the, but when it comes to pancreatic insufficiency, one of the challenges is diagnosing this condition. Because it turns out that as many as 20% of people over the age of 65 have some level of pancreatic insufficiency, and yet they don't even know it. And it may show up as issues with digestion, some intermittent or chronic GI irritability, um, some nausea, vomiting, decreased appetite. Um, it may show up in the form of uh, kind of abnormal stool patterns. And it can also show up in the form of uh, abnormal, like losing weight, uh, your energy dropping and chronic fatigue. Uh, so it's kind of a nebulous wide array of symptoms that can present themselves. So if you or a loved one are struggling from any of those symptoms, it's worth making sure you get your basic pancreatic uh, enzymes checked uh, and making sure that they're all on a normal level and functioning well. And uh, so just a basic complete metabolic panel often will give us your amylase and lipase and give us a general idea of are the enzymes uh, being produced in a normal level. And then you can also even have them checked uh, kind of on a sequential you know, fashion or after various meals and see the amount produced and the like. And then there are some stool studies that can be done as well. But if you're having any chronic fatigue, unexplained weight loss, abnormal GI complaints, it's certainly worthwhile to have your pancreatic enzymes checked um, and, uh, and then look at kind of uh, what is the norm for your age, uh, et cetera, and see if in fact there is some interrelationship. Type 1 diabetes is a chronic autoimmune condition that results in the pancreas not producing insulin uh, as a result of those islets of Langerhans being destroyed. And the risk factors for this include a strong family history, uh, recent uh, viral illnesses or sicknesses in which the body upregulated its immune responses. And then those immune responses were abnormally directed toward the pancreas itself. 
In addition, anything that results in a dysbiosis and leaky gut, right, uh, should uh, theoretically increase that risk of type 1 diabetes. So the use of anti-inflammatory medications, the use of a host of different medicines actually that all increase leaky gut, the consumption of animal-based foods, the consumption of various toxins and exposure to them like dioxins and PCBs and various pesticides. Uh, these are all real risk factors. In addition, the duration of breastfeeding for infants, because on average type 1 diabetes occurs in those under the age of 14. That's when it initially presents itself with a patient uh, beginning to have polydipsia and polyuria, right? Increased thirst and increased urination, often rapid, sudden weight loss uh, and other related symptoms where they're just like, what is going on? And usually that in person ends up in the emergency room, uh, right? In a state of kind of confusion because their blood sugars are so elevated that they go into a state of acidosis, it's called. And it needs to unfortunately be treated then with insulin. In few cases, the autoimmune attack uh, can be quickly stopped, reversed, and the body can recover. But usually that does not the case. And usually once those islets of Langerhans have been destroyed, uh, for the majority of time, the majority of people, there's no coming back and those people require using insulin. But of course, as you've heard me talk on diabetes, we need to reduce the total amount of insulin needed, improve insulin sensitivity in type 1 diabetes, just like in type 2, so that we need the least amount of insulin total. Because remember, while insulin is powerful in many positive ways, it also is a inducer of inflammation and of growth, quote unquote, in the body as we age, and thereby can increase the risk of heart disease and of various cancers if taken in very large quantities. So we want those blood sugars to be in a good, stable, relatively low place long-term for these individuals. And the best way to do that is through an aggressive plant-based program. Uh, one of the great ones out there being, of course, the Mastering Diabetes Group and their programs. Now, duration of breastfeeding matters because when a child is removed, remember what the whole goal of breastfeeding is. Number one, it is to provide the child nutrition and calories. Number two, it is to provide them with an immune system. Those first six to 12 months, that child does not have an immune system. And no other substance like soy milk, you know, based, like dairy based, whatever it might be, no other substances that are that try to take the place of breast milk uh, can adequately do so because they lack the immunologic effects of the breast milk itself. So a woman's breast milk has all kinds of prebiotics, probiotics, and also even various bacteria in the breast milk itself that is intended to give the growing child a healthy gut. And then it also has all of the immunoglobulins, right? That the, uh, the antibodies that this woman has produced in her body from various exposures over time. So that breast milk is magical stuff, not only for calories, but for the immune system and the gut health. So when you cut short breastfeeding, right? And the ideal would be at least a year, if not up to two or three years, right? Until the child themselves kind of begins to self wean and wants less of it and wants more of these standard foods. But if you look at them, even the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that even now, saying that I'd love to go at least a year, if not longer. And in populations, right, in which breastfeeding is prolonged, the rates of type one diabetes are much lower. For the majority of people, number one, they're not getting that immunologic effect that's so important and protective for the gut and keeping that gut healthy. But in addition, they go to dairy-based solutions, right? They're getting milk, cow milk, on average, uh, you know, sort of solutions mixed with some poor baby formula, et cetera. And the problem with that is now they have an unhealthy gut with a leaky gut, and they're exposed to all the milk proteins that stimulate an autoimmune response in the fashion of this molecular mimicry. And that's what we've talked about. If you remember my autoimmune talk in the past, um, that this molecular mimicry then causes the body to attack the milk proteins, but then cross-references them with our own proteins and attacks them. And that is believed what occurs in these children who develop type 1 diabetes early on. They are consuming dairy and have a leaky gut. They get molecular mimicry and they have a predisposition. And there we go. There's our type 1 diabetes. So the effect of our lifestyle, if plants, if you will, right, is going to be removing that dairy exposure, right? If you have any little ones or if you are an aunt, uncle or a grandparent, you want to really strongly encourage excuse me, your family member 
no dairy for that little baby, ideally ever, but at least for the first one to two years of life, absolutely none. Um, and we want to maximize that breastfeeding exposure. There's a lot you can do to support women in this process. In some families, breastfeeding is very much encouraged, promoted, and supported. And in other families, it's made fun of, mocked, and harassed. So you need to make sure, right, that you are choosing the former. So if you've got a family member who has a little baby, are you giving them a place where they can privately breastfeed? Are you making sure they have the tools? Maybe if they can't afford a breast pump, are you getting them a high quality breast pump so they can, you know, if they need to pump when they're at work or other places, um, are you giving them, you know, the right apparel that they can have? You know, there's so many aspects to this breastfeeding, uh, right? Do they have the right breastfeeding bras? Do they have the right breastfeeding upper, you know, the, the, the apparel that they can quickly put the baby on for latch, et cetera. These are very important things to think about, and it's things that you can help supporting a woman who's trying to breastfeed. Uh, if you yourself are breastfeeding right now and you have excess milk, which many women do, don't forget there are breastfeeding banks in which the breast milk banks will take your breast milk and give it or sell it to women who are in need who either due to, you know, let's say they're on drugs, they can't breastfeed, or they've had a health issue, or they just can't get good at breastfeeding. Um, you know, you want to help them. I had a, somebody I know recently had a baby and they couldn't, you know, get good breast milk production. And I put them in touch with like the La Leche League, right? Some of these breastfeeding advocacy groups who have women in, in all communities, you know, that can help in educating on how to do little tricks and tips on how to get good breast milk production. It was wonderful. And this individual was able to get good breast milk production. And now the baby's happy, mommy's happy, health is better for everybody, right? Um, we want to maximize that gut health. So as that child is getting older, right, and they're two and three, you're adding in those micronutrient dense, healthy foods, the applesauce, the mashed sweet potatoes, the mashed squash, you know, starting with these simple carbohydrate based foods that they usually love, and then slowly advancing, but not too quickly, and always avoiding the chemical toxins, right? It might be tempting for you if you grew up kind of eating standard American fare to be like, oh, I wanted them to try ice cream like I did. It's like, no, not, not dairy ice cream. There's no reason for that. Avoid the toxic exposures as much as possible. And I think as we age too, right? Because there are some people develop type one diabetes in their teens and twenties is just making sure that the toxic exposures are limited. Um, you know, as much as possible, washing off the pesticides off our food, much as possible avoiding the, you know, both agricultural, as I mentioned, but also the sort of, um, you know, uh, you know, factory toxins and the like. So clean, purified water, right? These sort of things all matter so much. Our next topic is pancreatitis. So pancreatitis is just like it suggests. Remember in, you know, medical ease, anytime you add itis on the end of the word, it means inflammation. So pancrea, itis means inflammation of the pancreas. And this chronic inflammation prompts the cells of the pancreas to not work as well. And when that occurs, the enzymes that are produced sometimes don't even make it all the way out through the channels. I've held pancreases in my hand and they're kind of this fatty, you know, kind of goopy sort of feeling little organ and, you know, kind of almost sponge-like, you can smush it in your hands, et cetera. And when you think about it like that, you can understand why the little tiny uh, sort of channels through which these enzymes and these uh, endocrine molecules are traveling uh, are very delicate. So it's like a delicate sponge. If you smush it together, you can block some of those little passageways. And if you get chronic inflammation in the pancreas, right, you can easily cause scarring of the little channels, the little canals through which they're traveling. And if you cause scarring, now the pancreas doesn't have a pump inside of it to like pump all this stuff through. It should just flow easily out. And if it doesn't flow easily out, now these enzymes that are sitting there can begin, in fact, to damage the pancreas further. And that's a vicious cycle, right? So you're releasing some of these, you know, sort of inflammatory enzymes in a place they shouldn't be staying. They should be moving downstream and going into the intestinal tract. And, and now this vicious cycle of inflammation perpetuates. The risk factors for damaging all of these delicate layers of your pancreas, the number one is alcohol. And so I want to reinforce this to you. If you care about your health, you should not be drinking alcohol ever. Don't end a story, right? I mean, that's just the reality. We don't increase the risk of breast cancer, colon cancer, increase the risk of dementia, cognitive decline. It's a neurotoxin. Stop drinking it. Stop fooling yourself. You may have, you know, just been something in your family and you think it's a normal behavior. It's not. And we need to stop, right? Um, so stop. Stop drinking alcohol it's bad for your pancreas. And it's the leading risk factor for developing pancreatitis because the alcohol damages the tiny little vessels 
through which all of these great enzymes and endocrine things are supposed to travel out. Smoking, similarly, the chronic inflammation related, this oxidation at the cellular level damages the pancreas. Next, elevated, chronically elevated calcium in our bloodstream. And again, this is why no value to taking calcium on a regular basis unless you have some weird dysfunction uh, with your parathyroid glands and you absolutely have to. Otherwise, nobody should be taking calcium as a supplement. You should be deriving calcium from your food. If you're worried about your calcium levels, go get it checked. Again, a basic complete metabolic panel should have that. Next, elevated cholesterol. So elevated cholesterol is a risk factor for pancreatitis. Think of it as, again, creating kind of a concentrated uh, sort of the bloodstream is blocking up little tiny blood vessels in there uh, because of all the elevated cholesterol, chronic hyperlipidemia, elevated triglycerides. We get this stickiness, we get this blockage, then we get inflammation, we get damage. Gallstones, which you know, gallstones are a much higher risk in individuals who consume the standard American diet. You radically reduce the risk of gallstones if you eat a 100% plant-based program because the majority of gallstones are cholesterol gallstones. And so if you're eating zero cholesterol in your diet, which a plant-based program does, uh, you essentially mitigate and eliminate um, gallstone production. So when you consume that plant-based program, you radically reduce the production of gallstones, which are a primary risk factor. Obesity. The chronic inflammation related to visceral adiposity is a risk factor for developing pancreatitis, whether it be due to impaired blood flow, the chronic adipokine inflammatory effects, or whether it be to also the increased pressure on just the pancreas from all of the stored fat in the viscera. Elevated blood pressure. We saw that nice anatomic drawing of how the blood vessels connect into the pancreas. If you have chronically increased pressure in the pancreas, it damages again the delicate lining of these vessels, which leads them to then scar. That sounds very similar to another organ we could talk about another time, which is the kidneys. The kidneys, remember, are these delicate little filters, right? So they look like that kidney bean, but inside it's layer after layer of these tiny little filters. And so when you have increased pressure blowing into that filtration system, it damages the filters, and in response, the body tries to heal them, but it just scars them. And now you've got scarring in the pancreas or in the in the in, uh, or in the kidney. And when you get this scarring in either one of these organs, now they cannot do their job well. Right? Very important stuff. Now, I, I wanted to point out too well, another primary source of pancreatitis are medications. Now, what's crazy is look at how many drugs are on here. I mean, walk through this a little bit. Can cannabis actually can increase this risk of pancreatitis. Very important for those of you who live in California and like to smoke it up um, or other states now allow it. Furosemide, right, which is a common diuretic medication to make you pee off excess fluid. Uh, medications like pravastatin and simvastatin for elevated cholesterol. They themselves can increase the risk of pancreatitis. Tetracycline, an antibiotic used often for uh, having acne. The list goes on. I mean, look, Losartan, which is an ACE inhibitor for high blood pressure. You know, on and on. Estrogen, right, for people taking that. Tamoxifen for, you know, breast cancer. Metformin for high blood pressure, or for elevated uh, uh, blood sugars. Prednisone, right? I mean, all of these different meds. Diclofenac, right, which is just a standard anti-inflammatory. You should run through these later. Just pull up the screen, look at it, and be like, wow, am I on any of these? Or have I used any of these recently? Or, you know, et cetera. Again, and even stuff like Tylenol, look it up there. This is what I, why I remind people, and my grandfather always said this, right, is drugs are toxins. They are physiologic toxins. They're not your friends. They're not some healthy thing that, you know, just kind of fell out of the hands of, you know, Zeus onto earth and, and is, you know, a gift to us. Yes, medications have their place. And for some people, they absolutely need them. Uh, but for the majority of people, the majority of the time, for the majority of diseases, they don't. In fact, 80% of the medications used are purely, right, for diseases related to lifestyle. That if you just ate the way that Chef AJ and I recommend, you wouldn't need any of these drugs. So look at all these, make note of them and be like, hmm, do I really need these? Do I want these? Can I get off of them? So on and so forth. So the effect of lifestyle is pretty clear here, right? That you all are smart people who are watching this, well-educated by Chef AJ and all of her speakers. And that is that lifestyle, right? Because lifestyle is the number one predictor of hypertension, high cholesterol, right? Obesity, elevated lipids, et cetera. It is the number one predictive risk factor for these areas. There's that random, you know, person out there who might get pancreatitis for no apparent reason, but the overwhelming majority 
Um, pancreatitis is directly related to personal choices that we're making. And so, right, the, the number one way to reduce that hypertension is what? A plant-based diet. Demonstrated with over 100 studies, 100 studies, right, by, for example, the Pritikin Institute showing this reversal of hypertension, right? A good therapeutic water fast, right? A place like True North Health radically dropping our blood pressures, right? The list goes on. Do my four week, my six week program, do Chef AJ's programs, right? But get all of these risk factors down and out of your life. All of you who are watching this are way too smart to be chronically sick and ill. I mean, these are diseases, forgive me for saying this, but these are diseases of, of unintelligent people. Ooh, yeah, because once you have the knowledge and education, now you have the responsibility. So if you're not in, educated, quote unquote, about these things, then fine, so be it. You're not educated. It's my job and other people's jobs to educate. But once you have this knowledge, no, 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 no. You can no longer just kind of ignore it. You've been given a gift. You've been given really just this precious gift. And I want you to remember that, especially during this holiday season, right? The greatest gift you can have is your health. The greatest gift you can give to others is also your health and their health. So remember that because if you have people under your supervision, whether it be children or adults, there's so much you can do to help them be healthier. And during this holiday season, this is a time to reacquaint yourself with a gift of health and where it comes from. Now, pancreatic cancer, as Chef AJ said, is a pretty deadly cancer, a pretty dangerous cancer. One of the reasons being because the pancreas is so delicate, right? It is so uh, important so that when that pancreas becomes non-functional, all kinds of bad things can occur. And it's in a relationship to the intestinal tract, to the liver, to the gallbladder, to the endocrine function, et cetera. And number two is that the pancreas is kind of hidden deep inside the body. There's not some simple little, you know, um, swab that we can swab the pancreas with. And often by the time you find it, the cancer is quite advanced. And unfortunately, it's one of those cancers that yes, it has about a, you know, the average lifespan when diagnosed with, the, with pancreatic cancer is usually less than a year. And uh, the risk factors for this type of cancer, for pancreatic cancer includes smoking, right? So put down the cigarettes now and put down the vaping and put down all the rest. Obesity, carrying that extra weight on our bodies, right? Uh, that again, the chronic inflammation appears to stimulate cancer growth and development. A high fat diet, which as we led and talked about, right, significantly increases that risk of pancreatitis, as does alcohol, which is the next factor there. And when you have chronic pancreatitis, chronic inflammation, uh, you're not allowing the body to kind of heal well. I'd like you to consider this just like your skin. If you have a little area of your skin that's rough and red and raw, it's chronically just, you know, it's just, it doesn't fully ever heal. And when you have this non-healing little ulceration on your skin, for example, that is a higher risk of various forms of cancerous development, scar tissue formation, et cetera. Unlike if it just heals over well, we're done. So chronic pancreatitis leaves the pancreatic cells in a state of increased risk for developing cancer. Part of this, of course, too, the studies now show us an increased refined sugar diet increases the risk of pancreatic cancer too. And with that hand in glove comes the type two diabetes, where now we have this inadequately controlled and normal blood sugars and this chronic state of inflammation, right? And of course, where does obesity come from and these other issues? Well, of course, they come as related to physical inactivity. When the individual is not as active, right? We have increased rates of inflammation, impaired blood flow, elevated triglycerides and blood sugars, um, right? And increased risk of obesity and the like. So turns out that lifestyle is a very powerful predictive risk factor for pancreatic cancer because obesity, right? As Chef AJ and I share, right? We know that eating on the, right? On that nice little uh, sort of, uh, when we look at kind of calorie density slide, right? We know that eating over on the far left on those vegetables and fruits and unrefined complex carbohydrates is the answer to obesity for everybody. We know that eliminating the smoking, the alcohol, getting rid of the refined sugars, getting rid of the high red meat and processed meats, these are significant risk factors for pancreatic cancer. It's fascinating. When I look at this list, of course, what do I see? I see the standard American diet and the standard American person. Uh, and that is why these cancers like pancreatic cancer are so dangerous and unfortunately far more common than we'd like, right? 
I was thinking about uh, Luciano Pavarotti, right? He's another one, very famous person who could develop pancreatic cancer. And look at, if you remember him, right, from a couple decades ago, you know, he was morbidly obese, had a gorgeous tenor voice, but morbidly obese and, you know, singing and wiping his forehead with this sweat always, you know, kind of it always made me worry he was going to have a heart attack. Um, but unfortunately, developed pancreatic cancer and died prematurely from that. And again, these high fat, high meat and processed meat diets with the alcohol, these are primary risk factors for developing pancreatic cancer as it induces chronic pancreatitis, chronic inflammation and dysregulation of these functions at the pancreatic level. So it's quite simple, really, when we come back to a pancreatic health plan for you. Number one, you want to minimize your need of medications because that is so straightforward. And, and it, it, you know, if you don't need the high blood pressure medicine, you immediately reduce some of the risk of the chronic pancreatitis. If you don't need, right, these other medicines like the metformins of the world or the prednisone, again, you reduce your risk for chronic pancreatitis, which is a leading risk factor then also for pancreatic cancer. Uh, we wanna eliminate alcohol and smoking because you saw in pretty much every one of those diagnoses of things that can happen in the pancreas, alcohol and smoking were implicated. These are cellular toxins. Again, stop consuming them, stop smoking them. You have better things to do with your life. Normalize your BMI. Across the board, this powerful change radically reduces your risk for everything related to pancreatic health, as well as so many other disease processes we've spoken about. And try to identify, are there any toxins that you're getting into that you shouldn't be? Whether it be in the workplace, in the agriculture, whether it be at home, whether it be in your topicals, uh, whether it be in your bathing, you know, et cetera. And then get that physical activity. We didn't touch much on it, but there are a number of studies demonstrating that physical activity reduces the risk of pancreatitis and pancreatic cancer. By adequately getting good blood flow into the tissues of the pancreas, we bring in our immune cells in, which can identify unhealthy areas, eradicate pancreatic, you know, the cancer early on before it progresses. Um, for those people who are struggling with pancreatic cancer, there are some protocols. I can email Chef AJ later about them that have been studied in the integrative medicine world uh, that actually demonstrate pretty radical survival uh, rates. Um, and I can certainly email those over to her later. And so with some people surviving well out, you know, as many as 50% of people surviving well out past five and 10 years, which is pretty remarkable in comparison to the alternative. But that program is aggressive uh, plant-based protocols with a lot of other therapeutic interventions and supplementation. So my recommendation to you starting today would be to think about your pancreas, get some basic labs to look at pancreatic enzyme function, maximize your overall pancreatic health. And when doing so, if you follow the recommendations that you've heard me talk about here, you're also gonna maximize your overall general well-being and health and continue to thrive and live the life you want. Go back to this basic, you know, I pulled this off my orthopedic health uh, slide just the other day to throw in here because I just wanted to remind you that even, same with our pancreatic health, we wanna start with that foundation always of nutrition and of the exercise, right? Before we start moving upstream, this is in every major disease process, including the pancreas itself. So with that, thank you very much, Chef AJ and team. Always great to join you. And I guess we can open the floor to any questions folks have. Thank you. That was really, really interesting. You know, it's funny. I had a dog that had pancreatitis chronically and I, the vet never really explained why, you know. But interesting. Maybe he didn't have a very good diet. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah, veterinarians don't usually talk lifestyle, do they? Yeah, not enough. Yeah. Well, here's a question. Why would organic vegan wine be damaging? Asks Diana. What I love about you, Dr. Esther, is you're one of the few doctors that I think tell the truth, like Dr. Goldhammer, you know, that, that I mean, there's just so much confusion that wine is good and coffee is good and That's salt right. is good. People want good news about their bad habits. They don't That's want right. the truth. They don't want the truth about their bad habits. That's right. So any alcoholic beverage, it, just to what I just said, alcohol, alcohol is a toxin. It is a cellular toxin. Go to your cabinet, pull out 80% isopropyl alcohol and smell it. You immediately go, whoa, alcohol. Alcohol is a breakdown product of fermentation. And it is intended as a breakdown biodegraded product. It's meant as waste. It is not meant for human consumption. So when you consume alcohol of any form and type, you are, in, you are damaging your body. It is a neurotoxin. It is a cellular toxin. You put it on cells to preserve them in the lab, right? Notice 
right? Tequila has a dead worm in it, right? Yeah, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. So you should not be consuming it. It doesn't matter if it's organic or inorganic. Or vegan yeah. even. Or vegan. None of that matters. It's alcohol. So the alcohol is the part of it that is the cellular toxin. Go drink some nice grape cider with no alcohol that's organic. Knock yourself out, right? Go have that. That's delightful. But do not drink the alcohol if you care about your health. It doesn't make any sense. Fantastic. Uh, okay, here's a question from Jennifer. What about medications like butasonide for sinus rinses? Is that a medication you would put on your list that is so toxic to be harmful? Uh, if it was in that list or another list that have you know demonstrated, uh, if it increases that risk of pancreatitis, you know, then with regards to the pancreas, I would certainly not have it. With regards to you know sinus flushes, uh, it's budenicide is what it is. But if you can get away from using it and just use normal saline, I'd much prefer that. Thank you. So if you have questions on this topic, put them in the chat. We did get lots of questions, but they weren't exactly on this, this topic. So no, I, we can, we can do others. Let's go. Whatever all right. Well, fantastic. I just want to just be sure. Okay. Uh, da, da, da. I saw him. There was your name you, many, many times. You yeah. know, I like it all. Let's just roll. Okay. Yes, sir. Right, here we go. Ah, uh, this is, I mean, they don't know that your expertise is really, well, your expertise is in a lot of stuff. Here's one from, from Susan. <laughs> My doctor wants me to take an osteoporosis drug. I'm 79 with osteoporosis and a hip fracture. I'm scared to go on the drug. Yeah. I mean, it's a personal decision. I think that's pretty, you know, you need to make that decision yourself, but I think you know, so first of all, 80% of fractures occur in the setting of falls. Number one thing to do is reduce your risk of a fall. You need to right, clean up your house, make sure you can see everything well lit, you know, little lights that come on everywhere, uh, increase your balance, work on your vision, make sure your eyes, you can see well, get your cataracts taken care of, wear glasses, whatever it takes. And then you need to be doing dancing and standing on one leg and ball tossing and all these things. So you should do balance therapy with a good physical therapist, transition to Tai Chi, line dancing, et cetera. And then you need to also be doing bone building exercises three to four days per week. Taking a medication will not change your fall risk. And it is falling that is most likely to cause fractures. So that's the first place to start. And then this, the, the taking or not taking the medication is a secondary issue in my mind. And unfortunately, too many people make it the primary. Fantastic. This is on knees. And you did a whole talk on knees. And from, Diane says... I've had both knees replaced and now I'm told to do more weight bearing exercise for osteopenia. What would you suggest? You have a great exercise video that we actually link to in every show notes, just so you know. Yay. Uh, I mean, I'd start out with just simple things, the simple basic squats, half squats down to a chair and back up, right? Simple little uh, half lunges, right? Just starting off in a simple way without overworking the body with 15 to 20 repetitions two times and then build up to 30 and 40 and go from there and then build up to using some light weights in your hands and progressively increase the demand, right? You can either do this on ho at home on your own. You can go to a gym, you can go to a physical therapist, you can get a trainer, but there are literally hundreds of exercises you can do to strengthen the legs and the pelvis and increase bone density and muscle mass. Uh, the first thing to do is identify what you're willing to do. And if you're unsure where to start, Maybe reach out to a professional who can work with you in your home and get started. Yeah, we have a wonderful plant-based physical therapist. I mean, Kapsafta, she comes on once a month. She can do virtual, but I think physical therapist. Love it. Yeah, yep. nice. This is from Nancy. I'm 71. I've been following a whole food plant-based SRS free diet for a while. Nevertheless, I've had problems with pain and some reduced function in my dominant right hand for the past few months and was told that I have stage four basal joint arthritis. I was shocked by this diagnosis. My surgeon is recommending surgery and told me the physical therapy won't help. Are you familiar with this condition? And do you think there are ways to live with it that are not surgery? This is the basal joint right here, the base of your thumb. 50% of the work of the hand is done by the thumb, right? That's one of the things that makes humans unique. We have this opposable thumb. So we do everything with it. Uh, I hate to tell you this, but you're human and you and I are going to die and we're going to disappear one day. And no matter how well we eat, this will still occur for us. And our bodies will, to some extent, depending upon traumas, activity, age, and genetics, will degenerate to some extent. An excellent nutritional program will slow that process and reduce pain and dysfunction related to it, but it will not stop right completely this process of aging and degeneration. So basal joint OA, it's okay. It, it happens. 
what is the treatment? There are tons of things, whether it be the supplements like turmeric and boswellia, whether it be topical arnica gel, whether it be injections of PRP or stem cells, whether it be, excuse me, uh, use of various braces, et cetera. If you ever want to talk about PRP and stem cell for the basal joint, which I do and ask questions about that, you can just go to essersports.com and click on book biologics conversation. I can do that across state lines. I'm not going to give you medical advice, but I'm going to tell you about what the science says with regards to PRP or stem cell for that joint. But there's tons of stuff that you can do for that joint before jumping into surgery. But if you've maximized every single other thing that you can do, well, then surgery has its place, right? Go back to that slide I showed with the triangle at the very top with surgery. And so if you can't live life and, you know, because of this joint and you've tried everything else, right? Well, then well, it's, you do a surgery with an excellent fellowship trained board certified hand surgeon who does lots of them and knows what they're doing. Wow. Did you ever do surgeries? I uh, small surgeries. Yeah. But that's, you know, I've always been the non-operative, try to keep people from surgery. Right. I, love, possible. I yeah. love that about you. This is from anonymous Dr. Esser. I have a friend who's been whole food plant-based SOS free for several years. It just found out she had breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Do you know anyone who's been eating this way, who is a breast cancer survivor and how should she address people who question her way of eating and the fact that she now has cancer? Yeah, I mean, tons of people I've known that have been breast cancer survivors and eaten, you know, and eat well, you know, whether they started later or sooner. Now, here's the challenge you want to remember a couple of things. Number one, uh, a lot of people who eat a plant based diet for decades still take birth control. Well, birth control increases your risk of breast cancer. So, I, I, you know, don't don't talk to me. That's why you when you hear me talk, I'm very strict about everything. We shouldn't just talk about food. And lots of people eat a whole food plant-based diet also are guzzling down alcohol every weekend. Well, that increased the risk of breast cancer by 15 to 30 percent, depending on the study you look at. So when you say to me, this woman is eating a plant-based diet, I don't know what that means beyond that, right? Nor do I know what a plant-based diet really means for that individual, right? So if it's a whole bunch of processed soy isolated protein, um, you know, that's a very different story. Let's say she eats a Esser and uh, Chef AJ encouraged program, but is still drinking alcohol and using OCPs. She, of course she can develop breast cancer right? But the likelihood of somebody who eats in a hundred percent whole food plant-based diet does not use birth control, does not drink alcohol. The likelihood of them ever developing breast cancer is like one or 2%. It's this tiny little amount because you've extracted out all the other risk factors. So we need to be very clear about that. This is not just about a food program. This is about a total lifestyle intervention that includes excellent nutrition. Right. Well, thank you for being so comprehensive. I know you have to go, so feel free. Um, have Happy, healthy new year. Happy holidays. I look forward to seeing you in the new year. All right, everybody. Thanks, Chef AJ. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Esser. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow a little bit later at 1 p.m. Pacific time for none other than... Dr. Michael Greger will be discussing his new book, How Not to Age, and actually will be celebrating my 1800th episode. Yes, you heard me right. 1,800 episodes since going live that first day on March 20th, 2020. I couldn't have done it without you. Thank you so much for watching live or even watching the replays. I very rarely ask this, but if you like what you see, maybe give me a thumbs up or maybe even subscribe. I'd love to get to a quarter of a million. I'm only 30,000 people away from that. And I don't, I try not to bug you too much with selling stuff, but my publisher has asked me to tell you that, oops, upside down, two of my books are on special. You get a great deal cheaper than you would buy them individually on Amazon or at bookstores, free shipping in the United States, but lots and lots of bonuses, lots of lots of recipes and videos. So think about it for a stocking stuffer. And if anybody has nothing to do on Christmas day, I was thinking of just going live just by myself, maybe with some friends and just hanging out for people that maybe don't have anything better to do. So thank you so much. If you had a question in the chat, I, he had a hard stop today, but please consider subscribing to my newsletter, chefaj.com. We don't send out too many. Uh, we send a few things out a week. Usually it's just recipes and such, but every weekend, Saturday or Sunday, we send you the whole lineup for the week, which enables you to email us the question who it's for. And we even email you back now to tell you specifically when it's answered, because sometimes with doctors like Dr. Krant or Dr. Lyle, Dr. Weiss, we'll have questions almost 10 months before we can get to them and they just keep coming in. So thanks again. Don't think I'm ignoring you in the chat, but it's just easier to keep it tracked this way. We can't really save the chat. And especially if you're watching on Twitter or Facebook. We don't see you, unfortunately. I, we appreciate you being there. But if you want us to see you, meaning interact, seeing your comment with the community, it has to be on Facebook. And soon this technology will also be on Instagram. So we'll see what happens there. Thanks everyone so much. And 
get a little bit break tomorrow morning and I hope to see you at 1 p.m. for Dr. Michael Gray.